Oh, yeah. Chica. Foxy. D Bonnie. Foxy, Chica. Freddy. Bonnie, Chica. Chica, Bonnie. <laughs> Foxy. 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 I think we're drawing on a few different things in aggregation. Um, <laughs> Freddy, Chica. <laughs> Bonnie, Freddy. Boat Knife is an arts and culture podcast hosted by me, Avery, and my best friend, Patrick. <coughs> um, we talk about things that we send each other. Today, we are doing a special spooky episode. Happy Halloween, every pony. It worked out that we both had a horror thing for each other. Um, for the record, um, the thing that I, I recommended her FNAF VHS. Stick around later to watch that. Um, I said that if that was too scary for her, I would make her watch The Lighthouse instead. So stick around for a future episode where Avery gets owned by The Lighthouse. Um, <laughs> how do you feel about old men? What's your relationship to old men? <laughs> How do you feel about horrible uh, old men? I I used to to go square dancing when I was younger. There were a lot of horrible old men there. That there, sounds there a lot really of, fucking good. Holy shit! There were there were there were a lot of very spicy old men talking about gun control <laughs> uh, at the square square dancing uh, room. Can you please dox the old square dancing room real quick? I want to go here. It's it's completely. The, the, I believe the the caller has passed away by now. Oh damn. Uh, <laughs> that's great though. I didn't know that until now. That's really really exciting. He he uh he played Skyrim. The only <laughs> thing I knew about him. I made Patrick watch May. Yeah. It is horror film from two thousand two. It is, um, how would you describe May, Patrick? Um, it's really very much so a horror movie. Like, there's not really that many twists and turns. It just kind of, like, is a horror movie that does one thing. Um, honestly, one of the things that I was most surprised with with May, because I had had other people recommend May to me in the past, was just kind of, like, how legible it was, um, how clear and to the point it was. Yeah, it's a horror movie. It's about um, being autistic as shit and also really hot, which is a struggle that I can relate to. Uh <laughs> uh, well, Patrick is wrong. Um, oh, May oh. is a is a uh, indie mumblecore rom com. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. I forgot. I, I it forgot. Is... It's also Juno. <laughs> it's about this young woman named May. And I was okay. Like the first time I saw it, I I I was how kind old, of critical how, how of this. How old were you when you first watched it? I must have been like fifteen. Okay, like, I was kind of young. Um, I know I was still friends with that guy that I made bangers for those who can't with. That's the <laughs> because I saw it with him at his house. Shout out DJ Kultera. Uh, Kulata. Kulata. Sorry. Uh, I was critical of this when I first saw it. That the film introduces her as having a lazy eye but then like almost the very first scene is her having this fixed uh but it makes sense because it's not just a lazy eye like we get the one scene of her mom making her wear an eye patch at school yeah so clearly it's not just like a signal of of her weirdness it's the thing that she thinks is barring her from having normal human relationships and now that it's fixed we are seeing her attempt those for the first time ever there's it's very it, also it's very important that um her getting her lazy eye big air quotes fixed is uh this very medical procedure i guess it's kind of like a nothing statement to say that l the light physical deformity is a metaphor for like mental illness because they're both kind of the same thing but uh it goes hand in hand it signifies that like um this is the only real corrective measure that her mother took with her mental or physical well-being and it was done j just for strictly cosmetic reasons as a means for like well you're not going to get laid if you had that 
and, and that's and that's like sort of the catalyst for how everything goes down if you really think about it i thought about watching this movie for the first time in a while because i played echo mm. and it made and it reminded me of it like it reminded me of this movie that i saw that was objectively kind of problematic but in the <laughs> process spoke to some very very authentic like queer truths it's very deliberate it's very deliberate in how it presents itself um like um may is a like mentally ill disaster bisexual like that's part of it yeah she... i don't even know if she's a bisexual she just says lesbians hit her on her a lot the first part of the movie is basically focused on her basically her misadventures like trying to court this like film school dreamboat yeah. dork ass very stupid man just a very yeah, stupid I love him so Giallo, much. Man. He's so he's so hot. The gay very hot, is really very intense. Very hot. Puts on the fucking Chromecast movies that he is making, <laughs> I guess for like film festivals or something, and expects her to like sit on the couch and watch them silently and then give have <laughs> thoughts about them afterwards. Very hot. Super hot. Um, Incredibly hot. Yeah. Ideal <laughs> man. Very emotionally um, unavailable. Just like. <laughs> Yeah, he's great. His name's Adam. She's simultaneously <laughs> being hit on by what is the lesbian? Her coworker or some shit like that? Yeah, her coworker. Yeah, her coworker at the vet's at, at office the vet. where she works at. Um, the coworker is like this, like she just sucks ass. She just very outwardly sucks ass. I like the thing where May is really good at like knowing what the the lead vet is saying. Like he, like she can understand his voice, but the coworker cannot. Yeah, and yeah. It's because she's 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 autistic as shit. That's <laughs> it's not stated in the movie, but she is. It, like finally, positive autistic representation. <laughs> like, I guess we could go into her performance a little bit because. Oh, I love her so much. Lead actor's performance is really kind of what sells this movie. If this movie really wouldn't be anything if she wasn't giving it her all every fucking second she's on screen. Um, she is so fun to watch yeah I, I i dearly love her she's always she's always moving she's always like got some kind of micro expression happening she very clearly has like a very good um idea of how it feels to be thinking through every individual action at every point in your life um and the <laughs> mannerisms that derive from that uh, it's just a very yeah. spatially aware... It's placed in a context that's very fun and enjoyable to watch, but there's still, like, a lot of weight given to, oh, yeah, this is this is a character who is... It is... There's a lot going on with her. She's got shit going on. It is truly the performance of a character that was not given a script mm -hmm. for the social interactions that she's placed into. There's so many scenes. Like, the scene in uh, the cafe where each individual part is trying to set up a different sequence, trying to set up a different excuse for why these interactions are happening uh, as she's trying to get a shitty art house boyfriend to notice her. Uh, each, each of these sequences is like, she's going through the series of mannerisms that she thinks is what somebody who is trying to get somebody's attention uh, in a movie looks like. Uh, and then just eventually gives up and says, well, he's asleep. I could touch his hand, his nice hands. I like how uh, I can totally buy that she would just, like, really be into his hands. Even, yeah. Even though that is, like, a foreshadowing moment. Like, but all, like, but also same. He does have, like, angelic hands. Yeah. Um, it's a very lonely film. It's a film that is, uh, <laughs> that, that is... I don't want to say misanthropic because there is so much effort put in by everyone involved, all of the characters in the film. Um, there is so much effort put into trying to understand all of these people. Uh, and even at the end, she's really still trying to uh, understand to understand and relate to these people uh, that she is talking to and touching and such. Um, but it just kind of doesn't come through. It's it's touch starvation. It's a touch starvation movie. It's about like it is. It is. It's, it's like it's she very, wants it's to very, touch. Shit. It's very harsh. 
<laughs> it's very, very harsh, harsh on that front. Um, but I but I can get into like the main thing I think that this film is doing before we get into like what actually happens in it. <laughs> the reason I like I I want to interpret May as being bisexual because this like speaks so much to like bisexual experience in that she throughout the the course of the movie like has different aspects of herself compartmentalized and isolated and like tokenized by her romantic prospects like the the doofy film school bf is enamored by her like morbid descriptions of her job at the vet um her seeming like unabashedness and and quirkiness like he, he sees her as what is basically a manic pixie dream girl uh but the the moment that he decides he's in too deep is when like like first he shows her his like film student shit where it's just like a couple making out and then they start eating each other god and it's fantastic it's so good she gets the wrong message and she actually like bites him while they're making out and he is vi- visibly shaken by this and is 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 it's they kind of spell it out like she says like oh i thought you liked weird and, and he says like oh too weird <laughs> like that's the, that's the that's the clearest it ever gets <laughs> and on the other hand the um the the coworker sees her as this uh untouched like cherubal f- figure who can be corrupted by her like lesbian sex like haven um and it is it it is may who gets turned from this relationship after she discovers that it is not as monogamous as she hoped it would be she is simultaneously Uh, framed as being monstrous and infantilized in the same breath yeah it is this that acts as the catalyst for uh for her deciding like oh well humans seem to be so full of great parts but no great holes so she dismembers a bunch of people including her two like romantic prospects and like forms them together into a frankenstein doll very important Uh, thing is that it starts with her cat (laughs) is that her cat is as much so a part of this amalgam of people as anything else The, the cat is completely impenetrable as like a partner emotionally but as far as touch goes as far as honesty goes uh the cat is the closest that she gets to being able to to ask for something and for that thing to be returned she is able to ask for things from her cat um and i think that's probably why the cat forms the torso of the kind of frankenstein boy that she makes at the end um the last half hour of this film is very delightful Outside of, like, the last five minutes, I guess. But just most of it is, like, her... Fuck. <laughs> her... Uh, she, she, becomes the, she becomes the Joker. She does become the Joker. She, she goes from house to house, seeing all of these people who have on, are only able to really talk to her th- th- through these voyeuristic means and just fucking kills them and takes the parts of them that she likes and makes a real... And, and takes the parts of it. It's... Fu- it's very fun it's so much fun it's really it just becomes and, a slasher film at a certain point and that's fantastic yeah it it, it just turns into that and of course yeah. like the the main rebuttal is that it is yeah like it is another film about like some poor downtrodden mentally ill person suddenly like going on a murder spree but patrick pointed me out like this out to me she very suddenly starts speaking in a very neurotypical way at yes. this part of the film. That's the other and thing I want up. to say. It's so fucked up. That's the other thing I want to say <laughs> about can, the lead actor. Tell me about that. Lead actor's performance. It seems like she's not even thinking about it. As soon as she decides that, like, oh, okay, nobody is able to approach me emotionally. Nobody is able to talk with me emotionally. In any way, that's really reasonable. In any way, that's emotionally fulfilling for me. She, um seemingly without even thinking about it begin like it's there's no scene where it's like yes i will trick them into inviting me into her house the way that she becomes more emotionally 
um, available to inv- to enter their lives, kill them, and then takes the part take the parts of them that she likes is by becoming more neurotypical. She j- imme- her stutter immediately goes away. She starts do- she stops doing finicky hands. She starts giving extremely clear answers to things. It's not a uh, blank what she's doing. She's not yeah. being. She is acting neurotypical. It's like the bit in. It's it's like the SpongeBob episode where they turn normal. It's, it's, <laughs> she starts it's, doing that. Oh my god! Yeah, it's it's like and it's like, so good. Like seeing her with no stutter or anything, and everyone's immediately just like, "Yeah, I guess I'll give you another chance to invite you back into my life." And then she just fucking kills and, them. And a notably it feels voice so good. as well. Like she's, yeah. she starts speaking with this with this rich like womanly like uh, cadence. And it's like a complete. It's a complete transformation. I do like that. That is the shorthand, like for oh, she's fucked up now. Yeah, <laughs> now she has become demented. Is that oh, she's starting to act neurotypical? It's very, very funny. Um, <laughs> it feels very blunt and aggressive in a way that doesn't feel like it's really talking over the subject matter. It just feels like it's having a fucking blast with the subject matter at hand. Yeah, like like it. Yeah. it I, I I do talk about subtext a lot, but I don't think this film should really be confused for anything other than, like, a very, like, fun, character-driven slasher movie. Yeah, it's she, um, she, because it, it's not subtext. She is autistic as shit. And I, fe- I sometimes feel that I'm reaching a little bit when I start talking about, like, oh, uh, this is about fucking mental illness, homosexual, but no... She's just kind of like this. This is how the movie is. Mental illness, homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> all all sure. good art falls all, under that. Yeah. Except for Five Nights at Freddy's. You said that you had a take on the doll in a box. I don't think that... I do. I think I have forgotten. Okay. I'm three Heineken in. I'm sorry, sweetheart. Then let us let us let's talk about the last five minutes of this film yeah the film opens with this shot of her bleeding out of her eye and screaming into the mirror and the and it that's kind of treated as a cold open it doesn't really address that for most of its runtime then at the end of it as after she has assembled this real boy this real frankenstein boy want to do a quick sidebar real quick not really much to say about it, but I do love the reincorporation, reinterpretation of cl- like classic MGM monsters throughout this thing. It makes a lot of sense in relation to uh, film bro boy, shitty film bro boyfriend's obsession with horror movies. It makes a lot of sense there. It 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 just feels very good for it to be a Frankenstein monster at the end. I, I don't really have anything specific to say about it. It just feels correct and good in my tummy. Yeah, like like if you if you just say the the plot synopsis, it feels like it just happens all of a sudden, but like in the moment it makes sense. It it is a tonally it, it's a tonal package that makes sense to me. It feels very good and it feels very good and correct. Um but yeah, after she assembles this Frankenstein boy with a Frankenstein head, uh she starts she like she is happy about it for a couple seconds and then she gets very sad because uh, the creature doesn't really have eyes to see her with. So she goes over to the mirror uh, and stabs herself in the eye, uh, and she screams a lot, and it sucks to watch and think about. Uh, But then when she puts the eye on the monster and cries a little more, uh, the boy comes to life, and then the movie ends with them hugging, and it's... Yeah, it's 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 just the there's a shot of the hand coming up, and it brushes against her cheek, and then the credits roll. Another thing that just feels very correct. I don't like. Yeah. It, yeah. I. Because the only thing she wants is to be able to see, to be seen and reciprocated. That's the whole thing she wants. Um, and it felt really good and cool at the end to have that be the thing. And I'm also glad uh, that she killed all of the hot people that she knew. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I like at the end, I know it's a, like a lot of people found it very harrowing. And it is like it is like very, uh, like emotionally complex that now like she has suddenly gained this acceptance from this from this place that does not resemble any li- living human, but but still is something that that knows her and respects her. 
but also like the other thing that I, I like good for her you know yeah no it's very much it, a good this, for this her is movie. this 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 film, I think it belongs in the good for her cinematic universe. Um, yeah, if this movie kept going, if they allowed there to be another scene after this, it would be her being arrested or some shit. But it doesn't. It leaves us on this note of her chilling in her in her apartment with the cool boy that she made, uh, and now she is able to uh, have a really cool sensory experience, uh, have a really cool just emotional experience with this weird fucked up dude, and that's cool. And I like it. Hey, we usually spoil all of the things that we talk about on here, and I should probably start putting a disclaimer for that in the description of all of these, but just like if you do want to watch this even after we talk about it a little bit, big, big content warning for animal death. Really, really bad animal death. Really super yeah, bad an, animal an death. Yeah, an incredibly harsh animal death in this film. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and also like animal. general like squeamish slasher stuff mild I, I guess if you're sensitive to i don't want to call it cringe comedy but it is <laughs> kind of it's 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 a variety of cringe comedy that uh involves neurodivergent people um so be careful for it made that. it like it made me feel seen but it also might like fucking get you yeah yeah be careful uh, so what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that if this film was about me and starred me, then um, which it does, the Frank, the, the the Frankenstein boy at the end would be a gigantic Pomeranian. Yes, yes. That's that's my that's my that's my take. The it's movie feels the movie feels like it's very mu it was very much made in 2002. I will say that. Um, it, it, I think it works for the movie's benefit, but it definitely feels like right on the cusp of everyone shifting to shooting on digital. Um, it has a really neat kind of fun texture to it that most movies that the, the were sound the soundtrack the soundtrack the soundtrack is very Casio. <laughs> yes, extremely, extremely. Also, um, and, like it's it's Casio and also like alternative hits from the director's like MP3 player. Yeah, like... <laughs> it does. It does the Greg Araki thing where they just hit, where the soundtrack is songs that I like, which is good and I like. Yeah, every like I will make fun of directors who do that, but also same. Yeah. Also, if I had this budget, I would do that. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that there are a couple scenes that feel kind of like they're just kind of waggling the hands at the camera they're just kind of saying ooh real real fucked up um the the dog breaking and the blind kids crawling around and it was a bit much for me i see <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like a bit, a bit too much i was i was going to say unnecessary. that's that's the biggest like that's that's the biggest loose dumpling in the film i don't know why it's there yeah that's just, such a weird just, just like, really just the and, most like, horribly upsetting shit possible just kind of like put it in the movie put it in them let's set up this thing so that we may um so that we may like just show the audience the most fucked up thing that we can imagine and then like leave it there and like just forget about it <laughs> if i had to guess I'd say that in an earlier draft, they probably had it so that she was going to kill one of the kids and make it part of the thing. But then as they went along, there was either they either rethought that um, or there was an ESRB thing and they just or not ESRB mo movie rating thing. I have not um, gone down like the rabbit hole of this director's other work. I kind of want to because it's like. May is an outlier. He he is a like slasher movies slasher dude. Like like most of his movies are just in incredibly campy, over the top, uh, gore horror. One of my friends on Letterboxd was very very excited about The Woman, which is a movie about a woman that's fucked up. Um, so <laughs> so I'll probably watch that at some point. That's probably going to be the next one I watch from this guy. It makes a lot more sense when it's it's like you see it as a like a slasher movie taking on elements of like character study and yeah and shit you know having fun uh in in that in that lens it is very fun to watch i think you have to approach it uh, in a very particular mindset but it's really fun to do when you do that big booty for you ah! welcome to the second recording session 
What are you talking about? This is exactly the same recording session, Patrick. Don't you don't you yeah, understand right. the 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 forward procession of time? Yeah, I forgot this was recorded on the same night, but we're actually being subjected to Bonnie and Chica and Freddie and Foxy's camera tricks. They're fucking with our cameras. Uh, and they're distorting the picture so that they're scatic and static and it's scary. <laughs> um, let's disclose up front that neither of us have played any of the Five Nights at Freddy's games. Nor, I, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I don't intend to play any of them in my natural born life, really. Yeah. Unless circumstances that's, that's change. Really, they, they seem very hostile to me, specifically. All I know about them is that you're in a room. Uh, there's there's Chuck E. Cheese animatronics out to get you, and you have to to keep them at bay with two like big metal doors that require power to remain shut. Video video games. games. Some of you may think that this makes us critically ill-equipped to negotiate um, the artistic intent. Uh, and merits of a Five Nights at Freddy's fan series. And you'd be right. I'd recommend going on a website called twitter.com. And if you actually notice, if you actually go to my account, you might notice that I actually have hundreds of more followers than you do uh, and a lot more friends. And my, and my cock is really big. So I think that we're actually going to have a great discussion of FNAF EHA. I know um, more about the five nights of freddy series than avery i think i've seen let's plays of the video games um and i have looked into the lore on my own mostly because of fnaf vhs i felt that it would be important to go over a little bit of five nights of freddy's lore that uh will probably aid in the discussion of the video at hand because i'm sure a lot of the people who are listening to this have not uh Played Five but, Nights but, at Freddy's. But like, just, just, just one thing. Even before we go into that, mm -hmm. like, I went into, yeah, I yeah. went into FNAF VHS Cold Turkey with zero priming, and it is like pretty fucking good. Um, with zero context. Uh, I, I recommend you watch it, and then you get your friend who knows about what's going on, like, to give you the scoop. Um, Five Nights at Freddy. I. There are some jump scares in it, but they are the best jump scares to, that that have yet been done. <laughs> and you know, like They're like no, nothing scares. nothing's ever gonna get you as bad as a uh, scary maze game did back in like two thousand nine or whatever. Like nothing's gonna get you that bad. Yeah, dude, nothing will ever. And I wish that I could feel as much about anything as I could feel about um, the time when. Mr. Creepypasta on his Facebook page said he was doing a face reveal and then you clicked on the link that he put in there and it was the loudest Jeff the Killer screamer I'd ever <laughs> fucking heard. <laughs> Nothing will ever make me feel as much as that felt, I think. I think that was the end of it. That just fried me. <laughs> so, William Afton is uh, not real. He's in Five Nights at Freddy's. William Afton. If he is real, it would be new. William story. Afton is being played by Jimmy Kimmel in the new Illumination animation uh, FNAF feature film. <laughs> Michael Afton is uh, going to be played by Tim Chalamet. But William Afton is the inventor of the Five Nights at Freddy's in universe equivalent of Chuck E. Cheese's. Um, in one of the early locations uh, in the restaurant, uh, a child, um, while being pranked by a group of older kids, a younger child, uh, gets his head shoved into one of the animatronic suits. That's like his mouth is gaping open because the kid is really afraid of the animatronics um, and the animatronic malfunctions and closes down on the child's head uh, and kills him. Uh, after that, that location shuts down. They open a new location, uh, try to rebrand a little bit up the branding. William Afton goes uh, cuckoo insane bananas because he's a crazy evil guy um, and starts killing children on the premises because um, he has issues, latent issues with his son, Michael Afton. Um, uh, so he, he, he goes through, I, well, four children ultimately are killed at the second location. Those children's ghosts go on to inhabit the bodies of the four suits that are the best known, the ones from the first game, Bonnie, Chica, Freddy, Foxy. 
Um, oh, those yeah. four, the spirits of those kids. Chica. Bon, Chica. William Afton goes onto the premises late at night one night. I forget exactly why. He was probably trying to kill another kid or did kill another kid or something. It's not that important. Um, he is cornered in a back room by these uh, the spirits of these kids who have uh, taken control of the animatronic suits. They uh, push him back into a corner to escape from them. He climbs into an old rundown suit, which is the Bonnie equivalent from the one of the earlier ki- locations, the location where the kid's head got bit. So he climbs into this suit, uh, tries to get comfortable, and all of the mechanisms trigger at once, maiming him horribly uh, and trapping him in the suit. He doesn't die, but he is very close to death. That location shuts down. All the franchises shut down. Um, and then uh, several years pass uh, where William Afton is just waiting alone in uh, the, r- the room, just kind of dying and feeling bad, but not actually dying because he can't die right now. Um, but what does happen is that uh, that final location is reopened as a haunted house type thing. Like, the, the, like after news about the kids getting murdered there gets around and William Afton disappears mysteriously, that is converted into a haunted house touristy attraction type thing. And in there, um, one of, I think it's either, yeah, it's one of Afton's other kids or some shit like that. Like someone directly related to Afton um, comes in um, and, and eventually burns the location down. Now in the games, William Afton doesn't die and continues to do freaky shit after that. That's the, that's really all of the parts that are relevant for talking about FNAF. Yeah, VHS. in in FNAF VHS, he does die. <laughs> that that is that was explicitly stated by uh, Squimpus McGrimpus. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> it is important to it is important to go over the lore in that anal detail because uh, there are some small but major tweet. <laughs> I'd call them quality of life changes <laughs> to the plot of FNAF VHS. Um, that uh, really only makes sense within the context of uh, the game's overarching plot. Uh, FNAF VHS is, um, it's a bit of a, an alternate take on the canon events of the story. A lot of comments say that like it focuses on the things that they kind of wish that the games would dwell a little bit more on. Like, it, it, it gets way more into how the animaton- animatronics are possessed by children. And it goes way more into, like, William Afton's particular issues. And it makes a couple, like, uh, canon tweaks that sort of spice up the motivations of, of the characters a bit more. The format of the series itself is interesting, if you want to talk yeah, about Yeah, the, the, the format is, um, it's very found footage, uh, although it doesn't quite keep up with that for the entire thing. The narrative is told mainly through uh, various spooky 3D animated vignettes with spooky text on them, and it's way more interesting than it sounds. Uh... <laughs> Each of them is contained with it within the further framing device of it being like a VHS tape that was either found on the premises or or well well initially it's believed to be like oh these were found on the premises but as the series goes along um it becomes more and more obvious that these are either being sent to michael afton who in this version is the one who burns down um the uh final haunted house location with william afton inside of it um or um but even after that it still keeps pulling the plot away and it feels like there's like additional persons who are present in the plot who are never really addressed directly after a while it, it's it seems to sort of morph into just a sort of vhs coded horror thing like it, it sort of stops trying to explain it in universe except for once right at the end right near the end the, <laughs> the, the second to last one which is like william afton's like big monologue probably my favorite moment in the in the series that that is that is explained as like actually being william afton's confessional tape that he that he keeps in a place and he know and he knows when it's been stolen yo or touched not even stolen touched because yeah. he looks at it every day because he's a nasty little man. nasty little man i think that addressing this as a fan work is really only half the context uh 
because it fits much more comfortably in my mind into the broader field of like lost media horror or like online creepypasta like ARG web series spooky marble hornets material. There's been a long shift over time where uh, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, um, there was a everything was mostly focused on cryptids. Most of the biggest creepypastas at the time were like cryptids and Jeff the Killer um, and things like that, like Slenderman, Marble Hornets. Uh, the largest group fiction project at the time um, was uh, Slenderverse, which incorporated the, the, the efforts of a number of uh, film, number of filmmakers, most prominently Everman Hybrid and Marble Hornets, uh, into telling a semi-coherent story based around um, one cryptid. What's what, changed what, okay, over time was, is that uh, yeah, go, was go. Everyman Hybrid actually good? I like it. I <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very silly. Um, it leans a lot more into the comedic elements of it being a web series where you run around in the woods with your homies in New Jersey because you're bored, <laughs> especially near the end. Um, and it's very goofy and silly, and I like it a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what has happened over time is that um, most of the web series now, most of the big horror web series, first of all, there's uh, much more of a place for like fandom crossover stuff like this. Like a lot of the comments on these videos are like, wow, I can't actually believe that I'm enjoying. This is really making me scared of Five Nights at Freddy's again. Uh, people are kind of like there's crossover appeal to this sort of stuff. Uh, this isn't the only Five Nights at Freddy's fan material that's gotten a big following outside of Five Nights at Freddy's. The other main trend that I've noticed with uh, online web horror stuff is that there is, and I guess this has always been a thing, but it's much more prominent now, is that there's much more of an emphasis on a medium-based horror. Like, there's an emphasis on, a, like, VHS tapes and stuff. Like, kids are very, very interested in VHS tapes um, and shit that can hurt you through the screen and looking through documents and stuff. Because now every horror web series now, like Pets Cop or whatever, it's like part of the mystery is like, oh, why are these files here? Who is getting these? Uh, and kids uh, are very into that kind of stuff. And FNAF VHS is as much a part of that as it is a part of Five Nights at Freddy's fan material, which is interesting and fun to me. I, I'm very interested in this renowned interest in, in VHS, mostly as a vehicle for horror. Um, it's it, this particular quirk of VHS is used spectacularly throughout the series. The fact that a a VHS recording of blackness looks more dangerous, like it looks like it's easy, yeah. it's easier to catch glimpses of something that isn't there if it's if there's a bit of fuzz on it, and that that is used really excellently in this in this series. That sort of ambiguity between like like that that negative space is never truly negative when everything has an underlying noise floor. Everyone loves the bit in Local 58 where the face goes away, but you can still see the face. Everyone fucking loves that shit. It's classic. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, that is the good shit. Uh, and there's several moments in FNAF VHS like that. Um, like, what, like the... the for me, the highlight of the entire series, and one that I think like you could just go and look at this one out of context and really understand what where the series is coming from is um facial recognition testing. That that's the best one. It's seeming that's probably it, my favorite. It, it's one. Yeah. it seemingly has zero function within like the whole canon, but um, it's it's definitely the most effective on like a purely execution level. Uh. The conceit is just like apparently this 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 puppet can detect criminals, and this guy is like testing how well it is at detecting criminals, and if it sees a criminal, it makes a little beeping noise that's like adorable. Good, very good. But like the on a purely execution level, it is um so paralyzingly scary, like like the tension rising. Like, like the the noise that it makes when it sees a criminal is like so small and dry and like every time it happens I keep on thinking like there's gonna be some kind of jump scare uh, and then but but the payoff to that is just that it, it sees what is implied to be William Afton and then like charges off screen and the dude gets really mad and he says I quit smart guy um <laughs> but but 
but when he gets up, there's like a barely noticeable face in the background, like sort of yeah. <laughs> like like they, they they just they just put that there. And then the and then the whole criminal bit happens. Um You've you've seen the criminal I've, bit. You've seen the criminal bit. If you're this you see, And it's great. It's so good. Um I made a tweet. I made a tweet this one time, and you know what? I, I did not know that th that it had already existed when I made the tweet, but it was essentially just like, I imagine the worst possible jump scare would be if instead of like making a loud noise, you instead cut something out. And the change, the thing that was scaring you was subtle enough that it takes a second to realize what's scary about it. That would be the worst possible jump scare because like being given the signal that something has happened and not knowing exactly what and then being like given something to notice that is the looping criminal voice then suddenly cutting out and the scare is just the face looks marginally spookier but it it kills it kills me it kills me <laughs> i think the thing with the face exactly is that it moves the eyes up enough that it takes you a moment to notice that the pupils are gone. You have to look up a little bit to notice that the pupils are gone from the face. Yeah. Oh, it's um, so fucking good. I especially like I think the first sign of the of the 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 storytelling chops on this series is the third one, the Chica one. Yeah. Where yeah, yeah, yeah. Where this is a, this is another anti jump scare. The the Chica one is really is is really excellent. Um like the the one that comes before it is is the Bonnie one, which is like almost it it is very frightening in the moment, but it's also kind of funny, uh, because <laughs> it's like let's test the robot's legs, let's test the robot's ears, <laughs> but the ears don't move. That's the that's that's the first one that's a a little bit hand wiggly. Uh, it's really really well executed. Like the pacing of every single one of these videos, I'd say, is perfect. Um, but that but that one is definitely like a ooh spooky big scare. Yeah, the Bonnie one you know also also is, has like the one like biggest like goofiest jump scare in the entire thing. Um, <laughs> it's and, very sad. And I'm like I'm, I'm glad it was that one. But but um, immediately I think like on the Chica one right afterwards it immediately shifts gears because that one like it starts with this six, this conceit of that you're hearing tones that you will then see the robot respond to so you hear a tone on the left ear the robot's looking to the to the left you hear it on the right ear it's looking to the right and then you hear it in both ears you understand the significance of hearing it in both ears um and then you're still spooked when it cuts to the robot looking straight at you and it also it also gets into the um what a lot of commenters were picking up on, managing to dwell more so on the fact that the robots are all possessed by the ghosts of children, like dwelling on that more so than the actual canon did. It's, and it sucks to allegedly. watch, and it sucks to think about. Yeah, it, because because like essentially we are then treated to the monologue of this ghost child uh reminiscing on what it must be to be a bird suffocating in snow. Um, and I hate it. I hate it so much. Yeah. <laughs> Sucks. It's... Sucks to think about. Um, I It's interesting because those two videos are very similar in format, but arrive at very, very different places. Um, I was, I'm genuinely impressed by uh, the amount of different tapes there are, like the variety throughout this. Like several of them are like, highly produced training videos like theoretically they would be used as like training videos for the facility several of them are like tapes that would be used as part of the utility of working uh at the at their like the like uh the sound response check video that would be used by an employee there um the pirate cove pre-show video or even just like the bootleg recording of the cartoon that comes later three sailor minutes three sailor minutes um there's it goes over a lot of angles of this of this corporation and a lot of ways in which vhs tapes would be used within this scheme uh and outside of this the, yeah it's interesting the, the person who made this is like kind of young right like like the like <sighs> like 20 yeah like 20 something they're like like, like, age, they, like they've got to be like a like one of those SpongeBob ass kids. 
they i'm sh- i'm sure that they grew up watching the same watching the bad spongebob <laughs> episodes that were premiering around that time that were mostly the characters getting hurt so bad i feel that like like the weird emotionally unknowable filler spongebob episodes that's that's the vibe like <laughs> It's very much that. I'm just really impressed by the variety here. Yeah, um, it it is it is akin to an album. It it feels a bit like it does go on sort of format uh diversions like um security footage is another highlight. That's that's the one that just sort of candidly shows us a monologue or a dialogue. It's not a monologue if there's two of them. Uh, it shows us a dialogue between between a uh, two of the of the puppets. And one of them's cl- clearly a bit younger uh, than the other one, and it's very sad and 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 sucks to witness. There are like some decisions made uh, to change the canon up a bit, but it doesn't feel all that um, like defiant. Like this does really strikingly fit in with the general image of the game. Let me get into that. So, um, the event that happens at the early location that results in the child dying and William Afton going sicko mode in the later part of Five Nights at Freddy's canon, um, that is, uh, not the bite of 87. Was that the bite of 87? So much about. That's actually, nope, that's a separate bite called the bite of 83 for some reason, because Scott fucked up the timeline a little bit while he was assembling it. So that's a different bite. Also, it, I, I think even when the series came out, it was generally accepted that the minigames in Five Nights at Freddy's 4 were depicting the Bite of 87, so the, it might even be the Bite of 87 in FNAF VHS, but um, the the kid who died in the bite of in, in, in the biting event at the early location was one of uh, William Afton's kids, so be, because, and that like directly connects that event um, and gives William more of a motivation without really making him any more of a sympathetic character. Yeah, and in, in this in this it is explicitly like the least favorite son accidentally killing the favorite son. Yeah, Joseph was the favorite son and he was younger and he died. Um and I forget if he took over Golden Fredbear in the first game or the puppet throughout the series or something like that. It I'm going to get details of this wrong. I, you gen, Genuinely, if I get anything horribly wrong, go down in the comments and tell me so that I know for the future. Yeah, just 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 go in on Patrick. Like, no lube. Yeah, but you, can, you can kick my ass. It's fine. But um, that's the general structure. The general things that were made in FNAF VHS were changes that were made to connect the Vite of 87 or whatever it is more directly to William Afton. Uh, and also William Afton dies at the end for real. Which brings me into um, the point that I wanted to make about Scott Cawthorn specifically with this. Um, I don't intend to shit talk the series, the video game series that I have not played. I think that Scott Cawthorn himself seems like a writer, like a writer that can get ahead of himself a lot of the time, um, and that he didn't really plan for wanting the series to go on as long as he did and he's had to subsequently retcon a lot of shit uh out of the game that made it interesting um and for the sake of propelling the series along and now he might not actually be able to finish the series because uh he got criticized on twitter one time um and has canceled all of his artistic endeavors because of it i mean i i don't know like it was it was a bit it was a bit heavier yeah, I don't want to. I do, we shouldn't gloss over that either. He did. He did. He did take money from queer children and used it to fund the RNC, which is not good. <laughs> You're not allowed to write a game with furries in it and then do that. It's against the law. But I will say that one characteristic about Scott Cawthorn that is very good for the purposes of writing Five Nights at Freddy's is that he is Christian, and Five Nights at Freddy's probably would not be as narratively sound as it is as a series if he was not christian it, it, and that that did end up influencing fnaf vhs a lot and fnaf vhs is also better for that influence <laughs> yeah yeah it's, fnaf vhs leans further into the christian imagery than even five nights at freddy's does um scott cawthorn as a writer likes to 
and this is a good thing for a horror writer, but likes to immediately jump to things that are more disturbing or distressing within his plots, which is just kind of how horror writing works. So that's fine. Um, but I feel like if he wasn't a Christian, uh, the fates of the children would be a lot less interesting to negotiate and talk about. He wrote um, a game where there's no way for a kid to get who gets murdered brutally to get soft locked out of going to heaven permanently, which is good for the series. That is very, very good for the series. Because the scarier thing to do would be like the kids are trapped in the suits forever and they suck and they have to think about it forever. Um, but there is never a point in any of the games where the kids are like super, super duper trapped permanently. Um, and it's more so uh, interpreted as either like a purgatory state or a period of temporary suffering that will lead to a like a longer thing of longer salva period of salvation afterwards. At, at the end of FNAF VHS, the, the very last thing that happens is like all of the all of the kids get little memorials after the building catches on fire. And burns William Afton down. Uh, it burns William Afton. Um, in it, William Afton, after he gets trapped in the Springlock suit, goes into a similar purgatory state as the rest of the children uh, who have been killed and is sitting in there and rotting away in the suit and suffering for a long period of time, a worse suffering than most of the children, actually. And when the building burns down, uh, it's made very explicit at the end by... Uh, William Afton's uh, decisive exclusion from the memorial section at the end that uh, he is in hell, he is in the burning land, um, and uh, all of the rest of the kids, as well as Michael Afton, who burned down with the building, uh, are in heaven. That is something that doesn't happen in the games, but that only doesn't happen in the games because they needed to make more video games after that. I think it is very much to Five Nights at Freddy's benefit, or at least that it was written by from this perspective in this way a little bit, because I feel like it would have been a lot more cruel. Uh, it would have uh, interpreted the haunting period with the suits a lot more differently uh, if he was not Christian. Uh, <laughs> and that's my hot take of the day. Um, I hope that people take that in good faith. Uh, <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're allowed, you're allowed to, you're allowed to be fucking Kanye West or whatever, like, right christian shit into your games because like it is it is objectively a cool thing to draw inspiration from for anything uh the common conception is that he made christian games and then made five nights at freddy's uh which feels like a very incomplete story to me so i wanted to go into that just for the sake of like yeah it's worth looking at it from a christian perspective i'm not christian uh i don't know who god is uh i'm scared a lot of the time uh, I, but I, I do think it's worth interrogating that from that perspective. Yeah, it, it makes it makes it it makes the everything about the drama and the resolution at the end is is made more impactful by there being a heaven that the characters can go to at the end. No, that's it. Um, I I am just like I, very. It's just good. It's just I, good it is shit. it is well executed <laughs> horror content. It is. Um, it fe it feels like a like. A very controlled case study in this particular person's uh, language of horror. Even though, like, they they have said that they're not interested in like making horror as a, like a full time thing or a consistent thing, which is which is wild. I don't know how you like put this out and then be like, oh, you know, we're talking <laughs> about it. I've never seen any like creator in any capacity do the thing that they did after the series ended, which is put out a video saying, Hey, I'm not going to do anything like this again, really. So if you were just here for that, unsubscribe, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like that's fucking cool. I kind of, they like are that. so that, cool. It feels very honest. I follow them yeah, on Twitter. They yeah. seem very nice. Shout out to Twitter.com. Shout out. Shout out. To uh, yeah. It's a, it's just a very cool, horror artifact that makes a lot of sense from uh the perspective of the internet horror behind it uh from the perspective of like it feels like it was made for an audience that was a little bit younger not necessarily a whole lot younger but a little bit younger when five nights of freddy's came out had a strong emotional attachment to it and wanted to reevaluate it uh given a few years to digest it um and it really comes together even having never played this game it was completely uh, overexposed. Like, I was surrounded by it for a hot minute there. 
being a <laughs> Markiplier watcher in the early 2010s. <laughs> <laughs> We are still asking to this day if it was the bite of 87, actually. He was very prolific and prophetic in that way. Was it the bite of 87? For a while, I was saying, like, was that the bite of 87 was the last time a meme made me feel anything? But then, um, but, but then more to why it happened. Uh, it's an incredible meme. Like, the top 10 all time really meme. Really gorgeous. Mm hmm. I'm very excited about that one still. It seems like it hasn't lost it too much momentum, but it's like it's not in the heyday right now, which is fine. I will continue to not play Five Nights at Freddy's from here on because I got annoyed while looking into the plot for Sister Location and said, this is stupid, fuck this, and I'm not <laughs> proceeding further from there. But the first four um, are very foundational pieces of horror. Um, for a lot of people, uh, they're I'm sure they're deeper in my sub cultural subconscious than most pieces of art. Um, yeah, it's yeah, cool. it's it, it's cool. I'm very happy that FNAF VHS exists. I'm happy that a lot of other things like it exist. Um, it's exciting. Yeah, uh, it's exciting. It's also very pretty. It's just a very pretty, well assembled series. Uh, cool. Cool. Yeah, web horror. Web horror. Web horror. horror boat knife. By, boat horror, knife is an arts and culture podcast. Next time, uh, we're doing another fancy big special episode uh, where we, we're still doing the Autiker one next, right? Is that next? There's a lot. There's a lot to get through. We are we are both okay, we are both on the threshold of their 2010s output. <laughs> God, I don't know if I'm going to be able to listen to all that shit, honestly. At some point, I'm listen, gonna. if I, you would like to I, keep... I it, still haven't... I can't, I can't do it. I, I can't do it. I'm sorry. It's so much. Okay. I'll tell you if it's good. I gotta listen to NTS sessions because I still have not... God. <laughs> um, I'm, at some point, we're going to be talking about Autiker's full discography. I don't know what we're going to be doing after this. <laughs> I don't um, even know if I'm going to be alive. <laughs>